I'm going to talk about um, solar sources um, and I actually found it quite difficult to put this, this talk together because solar sources, it's such a, um, a wide ranging topic um, I wasn't sure what I should really focus on. Um, and so in the end, what I decided to kind of focus on is really the things that are important um, for driving the radio emission and the biggest space weather events um, in, in general. So the first section we're going to talk about the solar atmosphere, which will hopefully dovetail nicely with what Pierre presented. Um, it's a slightly different focus on that. It's more on the observational side of the things we see and what do they tell us about the solar atmosphere and how to interpret them. Then we have to move on to solar magnetic fields because they play a crucial role in powering space weather activity. Then I'm going to talk about sunspots and active regions, which are really the dynamos or the generators of space weather. And then talk about solar flares. And finally, emission mechanisms, particularly um, hard X-ray emission mechanisms. And then we'll focus off or finish off on some X-ray flare observations. Um, so I'm going to start off with some nice, pretty pictures from SDO AIA. So again, SDO is the Solar Dynamics Observatory, and AIA is the Atmospheric Imaging Assembly, if I remember correctly. And I'm just going to go through uh, a series of images. And before I go much further, um, I just want to ask, if I was to show you this image, would you, would you think that this was a particularly active day on the sun or a particularly inactive day on the sun? Um, and so I think I've ordered these in terms of wavelength going from uh, the longer to the shorter uh, channels in AIA. Um, and I'm just going to show you the images. I'll go back and through them a few times. And I'd just like you to make note of um, where you see certain features and if those features are in the same place or they seem like they might be related um, through the various uh, wavelengths. So 1700 1600 kind of similar image. Um, and then suddenly we're up at 304 angstroms uh, and we see uh, a quite different picture of the sun. Um, and then 131 again a very different picture of the sun. And to finally we get to 94. Um, so key thing I, I want people to take from this is that depending on which wavelength you look at the sun, you see a very different picture. And there's clearly some correlation between features we see um, in one wavelength and how they relate to features in, in, in different wavelengths. And in terms of activity, when I showed you this first image, it's very difficult to tell. If you're familiar with solar observations, you might say, OK, there's, there's something going on. Um, but this was actually that day, the same day that Peter showed earlier on of the most recent uh, largest S-class flare that we've seen. Um, and you can see that, that same loop system over here. Um, and then finally, um, I couldn't get the HMI continuum image that I wanted for, for, for the, the right date because uh, Helio Bureau was down. But then this is a, a continuum image uh, from 6,000 angstrom. So if you went outside with a solar telescope or with a solar filter uh, and, and binoculars, this is the kind of image you would see. And again, I think that that doesn't look so interesting. It doesn't look like it would really produce an awful lot of um, activity. Um, so some questions that we need to answer is basically, um, why do the wavelengths look so different? Um, and another question is, what's causing the structures um, that we see in certain wavelengths um, and how do they re relate to each other? And then finally, like, if we just had these images and nothing else, what could we, what do they tell us about the solar atmosphere? Um, so again, Peter showed this plot earlier on, um, and this is just a slightly diff different version of it. So again, we have height above the uh, solar surface, so the photosphere on the x-axis. And then on the right-hand axis, we have basically the number density of free electrons. I think because of the, the scale, this is probably electrons per meter cubed, I guess. And this is the log of temperature in Kelvin. So again, 
photosphere, it's relatively low temperature, high density. And then as we go up uh, in the solar atmosphere, we see this sudden rise in temperature at the transition region up to uh, 10 to the 6, or sorry, log 10 to the 6 um, in the tr transition region. And that's accompanied by uh, a decrease in the density as well. Now, what's also crucial to take into account is how the instruments, so how does AIA actually observe the sun? And so this plot is called the temperature response uh, function for a number of different wavelength channels in AIA. So these are the same ones I showed you before. Don't worry, I don't expect you to remember them. But I just want you to take a couple of things away from this. So again, this is on the same temperature scale as we had before. And um, so remember, a lot of our corona is up here. Uh, six to seven is basically the corona. Anything below six is kind of transition region. And um, so basically, these are all kind of coronal uh, temperatures up here. And this is then getting down towards the transition region. And there's a number of important points to take away from this. So if we pick one channel, let's pick uh, 94 angstroms. So this is a basically the the response we expect, the number of counts we would record um, in our telescope as a function of temperature. And we can see it's double peaked. So that means that if we only had uh, 94 angstrom images and we see an increase in, tens in intensity in those images, it's difficult to tell for sure whether it's due to this slightly lower temperature plasma or slightly hotter temperature plasma. And this is kind of a common feature across um, the wavelength bands, i.e. they're not um, monothermal. The, the response of the instrument uh, responds to many temperatures of plasma and they're usually dual peaked. So this is a really good example, uh, the, uh, the 131 angstroms. So it could either be very, very hot plasma or it could be relatively cooler plasma. And the question is then, well, how do we differentiate between these two cases? And that's one of the reasons why AIA is so useful because it has this um, multi-wavelength capability, we can actually use information from all of the wavelengths to try and disentangle and say, is this emission actually at this hot temperature or is it due to um, slightly cooler plasma? And so then what we can do is we can kind of order the plots I showed you before in terms of where they, their temperature. So the wavelength doesn't actually correspond directly to a temperature as we've seen here. Um, so what we can do is we can order them as a function of temperature. So the hottest channel first. So this is actually the 131 answer, I think. Um, and then we're going to go down in temperature, basically through the solar atmosphere. These are all in the corona, by the way. So these are all up here in the corona. And then finally, the photospheric um, image I showed you, which is the HMI continuum image at roughly 6,000 angstroms, uh, is from, from down here. So we can see that basically the structures are temporarily or temperature stratified. So different structures um, are because of different temperatures. And we start to see features that Peter described earlier on. So we can see a coronal hole here, um, some active region loops. Um, and basically the hottest channel is, is also, I guess, the, it has the least number of bright points because, or bright region, because there isn't actually that much hot plasma um, on the sun on this day. Um, and then these active regions are going to be the sources of uh, solar flares and CMEs, which we we'll talk about later. And then we can see a, a kind of a shift in the appearance of the sun uh, in this the 304 image because we're now leaving the corona and starting to enter the transition region. Um, so basically, we always need to be careful how we interpret these kind of uh, solar images um, because the temperature response plays a crucial role. So let's go back to this in that you can't just say because something gets brighter, it's actually um, uh, like because it can get brighter. So something can move from one temperature band into a, another temperature band, which uh, I'll show later on. Um, so that's kind of a very brief overview of the solar atmosphere in terms of the observations and how we need to be careful how we interpret them. Um, because AIA and other uh, extreme ultraviolet imagers 
um, they're not imaging a single temperature of plasma. It's a multi-temperature plasma, and we need to be careful about how we interpret things that appear to become bright and then dim uh, in terms of the temperature response. Um, I think this leads nicely into solar magnetic fields because what is causing these structures that we see through right from the photosphere out into the corona, as Peter alluded to earlier on, it's the magnetic field. Um, so this is a, a typical diagram that you'll see an awful lot of times. It's the called the, the butterfly diagram. And so basically what you're seeing is the position of sunspots as a function of time. And you see this butterfly pattern where they start off um, kind of more towards the north and south equator and then migrate down towards the equator or they start off towards the poles and migrate towards the equator. And it follows uh, an 11 year cycle. And this bottom plot is just um, the uh, area of sunspots averaged. Um, per day. And again, this follows the same trend. Now, I could replace either of these plots with anything to do, anything related to solar activity. For example, flares, the number of CMEs, um, just the general uh, emission from the sun in hotter channels. Um, because all of the space weather activity is modulated by the solar cycle. Um, Peter already went, went through this, but how we can actually measure the magnetic field on the sun is obviously using Zeeman splitting. So again, this is just a really old observation. I don't actually think this is from 1908, but it was Hale who first used a spectrometer uh, to look at a sunspot and found that yes, in the center of the sunspot, there are large strength magnetic fields. The key thing about the, the Zeeman effect is that the change in energy or effectively wavelength of the emission is proportional to the magnetic field. So it's, a, it's a, a direct measure of the magnetic field um, of the sunspots. And we can see this is just a slit of a spectrometer put over a sunspot. And then we see the spectrum. And we see in the middle of the sunspot, the two lines are split, which is exactly what we expect from Zeeman splitting. And then Peter already showed this, but this is now a modern magnetogram. So this is from SDO HMI. Um, so basically, there's an interferometer on board the spacecraft, which allows us to um, examine the theme and splitting of uh, a particular line group. And we get these beautiful images of the magnetic field of the sun every 45 seconds in basically what's HDTV uh, quality. Sunspots have extremely strong fields. Um, I think the strongest recorded is around uh, three and a half thousand gauss. There, there was a paper that about that re recently enough. Um, and so this is what, what we see, our modern picture of uh, the solar magnetic field. And so this solar cycle is also played out in the extreme ultraviolet emission. So this is actually, these are images from SOHO, which is an older spacecraft than STO. It has a very similar imaging telescope on board. And we can see that when we're in solar minimum, we don't see an awful lot of uh, emission in the extreme ultraviolet. As we reach solar max, there's an awful lot of emission in extreme ultraviolet and then back down towards solar minimum. Uh, there's less and then back up towards solar maximum. Um, so the EUV emission and the activity of the sun follows the solar cycle. So some questions we could have is what drives the solar cycle? Um, and then what's the link between these features? So these two images are in the photosphere and this image is up in the corona. And we can see there's a strong correlation between the features we see in the photosphere, which is where the magnetic field measurements are taken, and the features in the corona. So let's talk about the solar cycle first. What drives the solar cycle? What drives the solar cycle is uh, a dynamo. The simplest model, or the kind of toy model that we have for the solar dynamo is called the alpha omega dynamo. So the idea is that we start off with our field basically directed north-south or poloidal field, then due to the differential rotation of the sun, that's the fact that the equator moves faster than at the poles, we start to wind this field up. As we wind the field up, we start to compress the field lines and basically loops will become buoyant, which is and where the loops come through the solar surface and uh, they'll form sunspots. And then we have the alpha effect, which then turns those uh, 
fields back north south. So we have north south field turning into east west field and then turning back into north south field with time. Um, a bit of a zoom in then is so we have basically the omega effect is where we're going to compress the field lines due to differential rotation. They're going to become magnetically buoyant because of the increased magnetic pressure. They're going to rise through the photosphere. Where they do that, we'll see sunspots and extend up into the corona. And then due to solar rotation, there'll be an effective force on these, the Coriolis force, which will then try and turn these, these field lines back north-south. Um, so this is the, the process which drives the 11 year cycle of the sun. Um, I should note that this is a very simplified model and we don't really fully understand how this works uh, in terms of uh, numerical modeling and, and simulating. It's very hard to get stable dynamos. Um, and then as Peter showed already, so we can use these magnetograms and our knowledge of MHD to then make extrapolations of what the magnetic field should look like in the corona. And we see a really, really good correspondence or we see the correspondence, we see why the structures in the corona look like they do, because they are basically uh, following the magnetic field lines. Um, and so this is just a PFS S model, which as Peter said, assumes a potential field. So there's no currents, there's no free energy to actually drive magnetic reconnection. And that leads us on to a really, really important pl plasma parameter or parameter in general for solar physics. And that's the plasma beta. So the plasma beta is simply the ratio of the gas pressure to the magnetic field pressure. Um, and here in this plot, I'm just showing how plasma varies as a function of height. And so we can see in the photosphere and below, it's a high beta plasma, uh, often known as frozen in. What this means is that the field lines are, uh, will follow the flow of the plasma or they're tied to uh, the plasma flows. Then as we move up into the corona, we come into a low beta regime where the magnetic pressure dominates. And in this case, the plasma is confined to flow along magnetic field lines. And that's exactly what we're seeing in the coronal images. Plasma is confined or constrained to, to flow along uh, the magnetic field lines. But then in the photosphere where we have all this turbulent motion and shearing, that's not the case. Um, so here the flows dominate and the flows can then impart energy uh, into the magnetic field, which can later be released as solar flares, which we'll see later on. So that's just a brief introduction. I mean, it's, it's a topic of a PhD in itself, um, but the most important facts are the dynamo. The dynamo is what powers the solar cycle and also powers space weather events. Um, so now, now we can move on to sunspots and active region. And um, so first, just, definition. Again, these things were first viewed in visible light observations from, from the ground. And basically in those type of observations, uh, sunspots appear as dark regions um, on the surface of the sun. And because that's when they were first observed, we've stuck with that definition of uh, a sunspot now. Active regions are generally groups of sunspots. Um, and NOAA, which is the National Air and Oceanic Administration in the US uh, assigns active region numbers basically as soon as there's at least one, one spot in a group. Generally, active regions have more than one sunspot. Um, and it's these active regions that are the source of the largest flares and CMEs. Um, and so what do they look like? I had to show some DKIST images. So DKIST is the next generation uh, ground-based telescope, solar ground-based te telescope. And it obtains these uh, simply fantastic images of the sun. So this left-hand image is kind of a large, a large portion of the solar disk. And I think this was taken at 650 nanometers, if I recall correctly. And you're seeing this convective motion, so the bubbling of the convective motion. And if you've ever seen simulations of what this should look like, they basically look exactly like this. These, these are fantastic observations that really confirm um, we have a good handle on, on at least the convective motion part of the photosphere. So that's how the fluid comes up, um, cools, and then goes, goes back down. So it comes up in these bright areas and flows back down in these dark channels. Um, it's just simply... Hey, what's, the, what's the resolution of, of those images? I think a single pixel is 18 kilometers. 
Well, okay. I think <laughs> I'd have to go and double check, but yeah, it's it's like unreal. And so then the right hand side image would be a zoom in of this. It's it's a much smaller region and it's of an actual sunspot. And so in this case, sunspots are typically, you know, the size of the earth and larger. So this is a really, really small sunspot. This is obviously made by some US colleagues who put the, the US in there as a scale, scale bar. These are just fantastic observations and we can look forward to these kind of routine observations uh, in the future once DKIS is fully operational. So that's what a sunspot looks like. That's all, all I really wanted to get uh, from this slide. And so then we can classify sunspots. The oldest or the, I guess, the longest running classification is the Macintosh classification. So they look at white light images. Why? Because we've had white light observations uh, for the longest amount of time. And they're basically classified in terms of three, uh, three components. Z, which is how far it is apart in a longitudinal extent. Um, P, which gives you the, basically the, the type of the largest spot. And then C is basically how full or what's the complexity of uh, the filling of the region. And that gives you basically a three letter designation. Um, but more recently, we've they started using the Mount Wilson classification or a magnetic classification because we discovered the Zeeman effect and we could actually measure the magnetic field of, of sunspots. This is a somewhat simpler classification. Um, basically, simple spot on its own, a pair of spots. Uh, that's a designator which you can add to other um, designations, which just says it's complex. And then delta is another kind of specifier which says that we have um, opposite polarity uh, umbrae in a single penumbra. And um, what does this, this tell us? Well, so active regions are the first indication of solar activity. If you look at an image of the sun, a magnetogram or a visible light image, and you don't see any sunspots or active region, the likelihood of having a large flare or a large CME is extremely small. Generally, we have this trend shown in the right that basically large, more complex active regions give larger flares. So what this is showing is the sunspot group area versus the maximum X-ray flux, and then the classifications is basically um, given by the legend. And so we can see that these beta delta gamma regions, so they're really complex regions, give us the biggest flares, and they come from really large regions. So again, basically, large complex active regions give us the largest flares. So there must be some relationship between the complexity and the amount of energy stored in an active region to the size of the flares. Um, and then another thing is that generally flaring rates typically follow the solar cycle in general. However, um, there's a tendency for the largest flares to actually be in the declining phase of the solar cycle. And so again, I just want to zoom in on, on an active region. This is actually that active region that produced that large X-class flare that Peter talked about. Uh, everyone talks about it because it's just such a beautiful example of uh, the standard flare model and what we expect. And I took these um, images from Solar Monitor, which is a website that we maintain. And again, it's just to tie down this link between the white light observations, which are highly correlated to my the magnetic field observations, which then propagate, or basically these tell you what you should see in the corona. So if you imagine your field extrapolation on top of this, we would see these kind of loops. And so what does that have to do with flaring? Well, there's only one movie in this because I find that they don't really do too well over Zoom. So I hope this one uh, is clear enough. It should play in the background a couple of times. So what you're seeing here is basically some magnetic field observations through time. Uh, the thing that will pop up in here in the top left is basically the flare class. So flares are scaled um, by classification, X being the largest, C being smaller. Um, and these are a number of properties that we can extract. Um, don't worry about what they are too much, but basically properties. Sorry, we can, Ben. Can yeah. I just, uh, well, what's, the, uh, what's the reference for that, that movie? Uh, do you I know don't... what the paper is, or where did you get that from? I do have it. Hold on. Um, where is it? It's really nice. Yeah, I, I, I'll have to go back and add it to the slide, Peter. I'll, I'll yeah. do that before I up, upload the PDF. Yeah, it's, it's, an, amazing, uh, it's an amazing movie. And so, sorry. No, go on. 
No, I'll leave you alone. Sorry, that it's just incredible uh, what they're calculating. Um, in, in yeah, yeah, the features. Yeah, so basically, as I say, this is a movie of an active region, evolution through time. Top left is the flares, and then on the right half, right right hand side, they're pulling out certain features. So the first one is basically the total magnetic flux. So if you sum all the black and the white regions, ignoring their sign, that's what you get. Um, and then some other more complex uh, parameters. The basic idea is that uh, if we want a solar flare, we need uh, to store energy in the magnetic field. Since we can't directly observe the magnetic field uh, in the corona, the magnetic field in the photosphere is our best bet for trying to understand this. And that's exactly what we're seeing here is that when we have a complex active region, in order uh, to power a flare, this means that there's going to be non-potential magnetic fields. So before Peter spoke about potential field extrapolations, that's where we assume there are no currents, there is no extra energy stored in the magnetic fields. That's a perfect approximation when you're talking about large scale structures. But the field above an active region or associated with an active region is definitely not potential. It's highly nonlinear. And we have advanced methods for doing nonlinear force V reconstructions of the magnetic field. The key thing here is that it is the energy stored in the magnetic field which powers uh, solar flares and CMEs. Um, OK, so now we've kind of covered the solar atmosphere at a high level. Magnetic fields, at a, again, at a very high level, and sunspots and active regions. Again, you could spend hours talking about any one of these uh, topics on their own. But now we want to go on to kind of the meat of this lecture, which is solar flares, and then emission mechanisms, particularly focusing on the X-ray emissions, and then some X-ray solar flare observations. So what is a solar flare? I mean, you can look up many dictionary definitions, um, but basically it's a sudden increase in emission across the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, it can be associated with particles as well and other things, but the main I guess component is just increased emission in the EM spectrum, in particular in the X-ray regime. And then just to complete the picture, uh, Richard Harrison will talk much more about CMEs on Wednesday, but CMEs are then a related phenomenon to flares. CMEs are just large scale eruptions of plasma and entraining magnetic field into the heliosphere. And one of the reasons why C flares and CMEs are interesting it's not just because of space weather, it's because they're the most uh, powerful events in our solar system. So again, flares can release up to 10 to the 32 ergs over a time scale of, uh, you know, tens of minutes to hours. And CMEs can be accelerated uh, up to about, you know, in excess of 3,500 kilometers per second. They have a mass of 10 to the 16 grams. They're also 10 to the 32 ergs, give or, give or take an order of magnitude. Now, in terms of astrophysical, um, energy scales, this is tiny. But in terms of the solar system, this is the biggest thing. So in terms of things that could affect us here on Earth, or if we want to study energy release, these are the best ways to do it. Um, so, so far, I've said magnetic field is what powers solar flares. But the question is, so we have a magnetic field, we have non-potential energy stored in that magnetic field, how does this actually power um, a solar flare? And that's where magnetic reconnection comes into play. So magnetic reconnection is at a high level, simple to understand in any detailed uh, mathematical or, or kind of theoretical way, extremely complicated. The basic idea is magnetic reconnection is the process that changes the connectivity of the field lines, allowing that non-potential energy to be converted into particle, thermal, and kinetic energies. So the typical kind of, the original model for reconnection is known as Sweet Parker. And it's, this is depicted in this diagram in the top right. And so we have field lines going opposite directions, um, close to a, a diffusion region. And basically uh, we, can, we can estimate the magnetic reconnection rate um, as a function of, of this S, S term. And the S term is basically the magnetic Reynolds number. Um, it, it doesn't matter too much, but it's related to the magnetic field strength 
and the diffusivity of the plasma, which Peter mentioned in his MHD equations. The problem with this first model was that when you fill in typical values for a solar flare, you get a reconnection rate of 10 to the minus 7, which is way, way too slow to actually power a flare. And it would mean that flares should last days to weeks instead of tens of minutes to hours. So there was a problem, and that's why they came up with this the, the Pechek model. So in the Pechek model, it's uh, they've just basically changed the configuration of the diffusion region, so it's now much smaller. But the crucial thing about this is that in the Pechek model, we expect to have shocks and outflow jets from the reconnection region. So it allows us to get a reconnection rate that's probably fast enough to power solar flares, but it also gives us uh, additional mechanisms to accelerate and heat particles, which is a major thing that we see in solar flares. Can so, yeah. I ask a question? Um, is the only thing that differs between the Sweet Parker and the Pechek model the size of the diffusion region? Essentially, yeah. I, I, I mean, so when you go through the equations, there's a whole family of solutions, actually, I should say. So Sweet Parker and Pechek um, are specific solutions due to the geometry of the diffusion region, i.e. The, the ratio of the, the, the length to, to its width. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, the, the only change that I'm aware of is that, they, that they're changing this geometry. But when they do this change in geometry, um, because you're now no longer uh, limited by basically the, the mass continuity through this, this region. Mm. So if you think of, if you have a, a large region a large inflow region, a small outflow region, you're limited by how fast you can get stuff out of this region. And that is actually what, what causes this low re reconnection rate. It's the limit of that you can't get stuff in as fast as you can get it out. Whereas yeah. in the pet check model, we can get material in as fast as we can get it out. But the actual size of the region where reconnection happens is much reduced. So then you have to explain where you get your particle acceleration and that's where the shocks come in because obviously shocks are very efficient uh, particle accelerators okay thanks um, and then yeah this kind of leads on to what i was saying is that if we have a reconnection region in here we expect basically uh, outflow jets and we expect fast fast mode shocks at the end of these and then slow mode shocks at the side of these and this is really interesting because we can now go and look at observations of flares and see, do we see evidence for these type of structures? And if they do, what does that tell us about what's happening in the reconnection region? Um, and this leads me nicely into um, the standard flare model. Um, so the standard flare model is actually a product of a number of authors over a number of years. Um, and it's not really a model in the numerical sense or analytical sense. It's a model in terms of it describes all of the observable characteristics and features of a solar flare. And it explains them in terms of, of, of reconnection. Um, and so this is basically the standard flare model. So I've just got a couple of different images. One is from one of the original papers. And um, this is actually an image from that 2017 event. And we can see structures that look very, very similar um, to the flare model. So what is the standard flare model? So the idea is that we have reconnection region. So we have inflows bringing material into the reconnection region. We have outflows. Um, and then these outflows, we produce hard X-ray sources at the loop tops. We don't often observe these. But what we do often observe is hard X-ray uh, foot points. So we have fast electrons are, ele are accelerated by the reconnection. Um, they then propagate down the magnetic field because remember, we're in a low beta plasma. So the particles are constrained to move along the magnetic field. They then interact with the solar surface of so the chromosphere, produce X-rays, and also heat the plasma. And then this heated plasma fills up this loop and produces thermal emission. So that's kind of the the sequence that you should have in your mind in terms of timing. So we have reconnection, which we can sometimes observe uh, in certain conditions, uh, giving rise to hard X-rays. Those 
um, accelerated electrons then propagate down the magnetic field lines and interact with the foot points to produce hard X-ray foot points. And then at the same time, this interaction is heating the plasma in this region, and then we get hot plasma filling this flare loop. Um, now, tomorrow uh, you'll hear about the radio emission, but what's interesting is that these same electrons that end up hitting the chromosphere and producing hard X-rays can either escape into the interstellar medium and produce radio bursts, uh, drifting radio bursts, or sometimes higher uh, microwave radio bursts that come from the same distribution of electrons. So it's nice to compare uh, sometimes the hard X-ray spectrum and the radio emission um, because it's the same population of electrons. Um, so I'm just showing the same picture of our standard model. And then in the right, I have kind of a, a mini um, time series or, or showing you the sequence of, of events. So basically, the first one of the first ob observational signatures that we can think of that we sometimes see is hard X-ray uh, loop top sources. And the star is there uh, because we don't often see them. However, um, this is most likely due to an instrumentation limitation. Basically, the foot points are incredibly bright in X-rays. This is incredibly dim. So you need an instrument that has a really, really high dynamic range. And unfortunately, as good as our extra X-ray instruments are, they often don't have high enough dynamic range um, to observe this um, bright source. The only time that we can do this is when the bright X-ray foot points are actually um, occulted by the solar disk. So these are on the far side of the edge of the limb and we don't see the bright emission from the foot points. We can then sometimes image or detect uh, this uh, faint hard X-ray loop top source. So this is due to the acceleration of the electrons. Um, then the electrons propagate down the, down the field lines, interact with the chromosphere by Bremsstrahlung to create hard X-ray foot points. In this process, they're going to heat plasma and basically this heated plasma will then expand into the thermal loop. And this is played out in these time series plots. So we see the highest energy electrons, i.e. the gamma and X-rays, basically immediately. Then slightly later, we see the soft X-rays because these are coming from the thermal loop. So the, 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 we have to actually heat the plasma. It has to expand to fill the loop before we start to see the soft X-rays. I don't want to talk about the radio too much because Owen's going to cover this tomorrow and the other speakers. But sometimes we see radio emission that's directly tied to these same uh, particle distributions and other times from uh, electrons that are accelerated out into the heliosphere or also from CMEs and CME driven shocks. And then also you can detect particles uh, in situ at, at Earth um, and other spacecraft, again, which are related to the, the flare accelerated particles, but the ones that escape from the sun. Um, Again, I try to avoid movies in this talk because I find that they don't do a great job um, over Zoom sometimes. But this is the same uh, the same SUVI data that, that Peter showed you earlier. So SUVI is a, an instrument on board the goes or series of satellites, and it has a really, really uh, wide field of view. And again, it's an extreme ultraviolet imager. And what I'm showing you here is that famous event um, in a sequence, uh, basically going left to right and then down. And this event here, whenever everyone saw this, this looks almost identical to this picture. This is like a, a prototypical uh, cartoon eruption of what the standard flare model would predict. So you see your loops down here, which you can't really see at, at this range, and then your plasmoid. And basically, as the plasmoid propagates out, you're left with this thin current sheet-like structure behind it. So as this plasmoid moves that way, you get left with this really, really thin uh, um, current sheet, uh, which is exactly what you'd expect from the observations. So this is just an amazing uh, observation that you couldn't have planned for better. And this is the same observation, just in uh, a different wavelength. Um, and so again, we see the same sort of structure. We see this kind of plasma, um, plasmoid being ejected out, and then we're left behind with this uh, 
thin current sheet and then really, really bright emission from the loops. I should mention that the, uh, these diffraction patterns um, are due to, uh, there's grids in the EUV imaging optics and they're basically, when you get a really bright emission, you get this diffraction pattern that's caused from the grids actually in the filters, which uh, filtered the EUV emission. Um, and then some other kind of typical features are flare ribbons. Again, Peter, Peter mentioned these, but these just play into that role that basically The 1600 emission here is highly correlated with the energetic electrons because this is an emission is actually from down in the chromosphere, that's photosphere. So this is related to the energetic electrons, basically. Um, and then when we look into the hotter EUV channels, we're seeing the thermal loops. So this is hot plasma that's been heated in the photosphere, expanding up into these thermal loops. And again, this plasma is constrained to flow along the field lines, um, which is why you see these beautiful uh, loop arcade structures. And then at the very, very top, we see like um, enhanced emission. So this kind of fits in with our picture of, uh, we have acceleration at the top and then uh, basically thermal evaporation uh, even though it's not real evaporation, it's often called evaporation. It's that hot material expanding into the loops, filling it with uh, hot plasma, which emits in thermal regimes. Um, so again, it's a really brief overview of solar flares and the standard flare model. Key thing is the standard flare model isn't, it's not really a, a model in terms of um, a numerical thing, but it helps us describe what we see in terms of the fundamental process of reconnection. And it does explain the timing and the general morphology of an awful lot of um, flare emissions we see. And so then we need to come on to the topic of emission mechanisms, um, which I haven't really talked about because there's only an hour and there's just so much to talk about that you could fill an entire course in emission mechanisms uh, only. And so just a note that um, there's basically two dominant emission mechanisms, at least in the EUV observations and uh, I guess the X-rays as well. So we have continuum emission. So we have uh, free free uh, emission. So that's free particles interacting with, with each other uh, via brown shallon and you get a free free continuum or you have a uh, free bound um, which again forms a continuum and then you have line emission and line emission is actually what dominates in the EUV and uh, I guess low temperature x-rays or low energy x-rays and um, line emission is complicated it's not complex but it, it is complicated and couldn't do it justice in the time allowed however it's really important to remember that um, when you look at e EUV images it's line emission. And because it's line emission, it's highly related to the properties of the plasma, i.e. density and temperature. And that means that we can actually use uh, ratios of those wideband instruments I showed you from AIA earlier on to estimate temperature and densities. And if you have a spectrometer, you can actually get that sort of information out. But I'm going to focus on the non-thermal uh, emission, and that's from Bremschalung. And one of the reasons I'm going to focus on this is because it ties nicely into the radio uh, session tomorrow and later on because it's often a related population or possibly even the same population of electrons that generate um, the non-thermal Bremschalung and the radio emission at least in certain frequency ranges. So what is Bremschalung? Simply put, uh, Bremschalung or breaking radiation is just due to collisions between charged particles. Generally in the case of um, certainly solar flares, we're talking about electrons and ions uh, because basically due to the mass ratio, uh, we get an awful lot of photon emission from electrons scattering off ions. Uh, you can obviously get ion-ion interactions, but they produce uh, a much different spectrum and a much lower intensity. Um, so I took some equations from this Contar et al. 2019 paper, uh, kind of following along with his derivation, uh, at least to a point. And so this is a general equation for the photon energy spectrum um, as a function of a bunch of parameters. Uh, don't worry too much, we're gonna get rid of some of these, but this is kind of the most general thing that you can write down, or one of the most general things you can write down 
in the case that we assume it's optically thin. Um, when I say optically thin, what I mean is that the photons that are emitted don't really interact with uh, the solar atmosphere as they as they leave. In the case of non-thermal X-ray emission, this is a perfectly valid assumption. Uh, in the case of thermal emission, you couldn't assume this because it's actually optically thick. But in the optically thin case, this is a general equation, and we can see it depends on a number of terms. So the local plasma density, so that's the plasma density um, where the photons are being emitted, the electron distribution, so that is the distribution of the accelerated, generally non-thermal electrons, and Q. Uh, Q is the Bremsstrahlung cross-section. Um, it's interesting to note that the cross-section is a function of the photon energy, so basically E here is a photon energy, and the capital or epsilon is a photon energy, and capital E is an electron energy. So it's dependent on both the photon that's emitted and the electron energy. And then basically this is an integral over a line of sight. Um, we can make some simplifying assumptions and get a, a nicer equation. So if we only look at photons that are initially emitted towards an observer, um, often this is called no albedo. Uh, we don't consider uh, photons that are scattered off of the photosphere, so it's only uh, electrons that are emitted towards the observer, and we integrate over the angle subtended by the source uh, for an observer at a distance or away. We get this equation, which is in units of photons um, per second per keV per centimeter squared, and this cm squared is now your detector area. So obviously, if you have a larger detector you detect more, more photon flux. Um, and so again, we have our plasma density, we have our electron distribution and our branch-on and cross-section. So if we choose F of E to be a Maxwell Boltzmann, i.e. a thermal distribution, what we find is that the uh, photon flux that's emitted is proportional to, to basically the density squared and then a Maxwell Boltzmann like term, not surprisingly enough. Um, and in the power law distribution, uh, it's not, it's basically proportional to the, the number density times the volume and then the power law function. Um, so we have different choices that we can, we can make now. Um, one of the first things that people did was look at the so-called thin target model. Um, how are we doing for time? Okay, right. Yeah, the thin target model. So what they did was they took this equation and basically they integrated it spatially and looked at a single instant in time. Um, and you can do this and you get an equation like this, where now um, basically if we assume um, an electron distribution, we can calculate the intensity uh, of photons that we expect. Um, Crucially, there's a dependence on N, where N is, is the density of the, the plasma. Uh, it's taken outside the integral because we've integrated over our spatial domain. And this is only really valid in certain conditions. And uh, particularly, it's, it's good at loop top sources, but it's not really valid for the hard X-ray foot points. Um, so they came up with, with a second model uh, called the thick target model. Um, and so the idea here is that um, the electrons uh, basically are lose, lose energy to the, to the background medium. So in this case, the electron distribution is whatever it is at a certain time, and that will give you a certain uh, photon spectrum. With the thick target model, what we say is that there's an initial electron spectrum that's injected. However, this this uh, interacts with the background plasma and loses energy to this spectrum, um, which is much more appropriate for the foot points because we assume that we have high energy electrons propagate down into the photosphere and they don't just interact once. They interact um, as many times as it takes for them to lose their non-thermal energy and to basically merge with the background thermal distribution of particles in the chromosphere or the photosphere. So again, we can, we can do the same trick here. So we can spatially integrate and we make an assumption that our observing time scale is uh, long enough for the electrons to radiate all of their energy and become part of that background Maxwell-Boltzmann uh, distribution. 
And so then we have an equation like this, um, where this new uh, can be written as this, and then we can we can write down an equation for this energy loss term. Um, and basically, if we sub this this in here and then this into this and rearrange some stuff, we get to this equation. Um, and so basically, it's a double integral: one over the photon energies and one over the electron energies. And it's not related to the source density. So there's no density term in here, which is kind of interesting, but it drops out because basically we have a, a one over n of or and n of or. And it, so it means that the thick target is independent of the source of the, the source density background. And so now we have two equations. We have one for our thin target model and one for our thick target model. That's great. Um, what can we do with it? Well, essentially, we can measure the photon spectrum. If we have an X-ray spectrometer, we can measure this. Um, and ideally, what we want to get out is the electron distribution, um, depending on whether it's a thin target or a thick target. However, it's really difficult to do this. Uh, it, it's an underdefined matrix inversion problem, basically. Um, so instead of doing this, what we do is we take a forward modeling approach. So what we do is we take our observed counts, we calculate some model spectrum, um, we confirm, convert this model spectrum from photons per second into basically counts per second, and then we minimize this function. It's basically a, a complicated nonlinear least squares fitting to optimize the parameters of our, uh, our model spectra. And so in this way, we can get at the electron distribution um, from our measurements. And in the case of the thick target model, we've got a couple of parameters. They don't really matter too much. We have the slope, so basically the power law index. Um, we have a break energy, uh, which is sometimes important. And then we have the slope above the break energy and uh, a low energy cutoff and a high energy cutoff, essentially uh, to make sure that we don't try and integrate a power law to infinity, which you can't do. And so this is then a model a photon spectrum that we get out. We can then convolve this with our spectrometer response to get it into counts. And then we can, we can actually fit this function to find uh, the, the parameters, um, which is exactly what we want to do. Um, so again, that's a quick overview of Bremsstrahlen, particularly uh, in terms of non-thermal non emission. And why do we want to do that? Well because we want to look at X-ray flare observations and see, can we turn um, the observed spectrum or observed information uh, to get at the electron spectrum? So there is generally two types of X-ray observations. We have soft X-rays or SXOR, kind of arbitrary definition that they're, you know, tip, they're low energy, you know, typically less than 20 keV, and these are emitted from thermal electrons. So it's, it's their Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. And then we have hard X-rays, HX or which are generally higher energy. And the key thing is that these are from non-thermal distribution of, of, of electrons. And so on the right, then I have uh, GOES observations. So these are soft X-rays. And then RESI observations, which have uh, soft and hard. But we can see that there's a definite um, component of high energy hard X-rays here. And so with RESI, what we can do is we can take a time interval during this time interval, we can compute the spectrum. And that's what I've done here. So this is just an example of a RESI spectrum. So it's the photon energy in keV versus the number of photons, uh, basically per square centimeter per keV per second. Um, and so what we can do is we can then do that process I was just saying. We can, we can basically fit this observed spectrum to a model and then the model parameters give us an idea of the, um, uh, the non-thermal electron parameters. Uh, in particular, these are basically the, the P and Q, the EE break, and all those other parameters. But what's amazing with RESI is that we can do this as a function of space and time. So we can get information on that underlying electron distribution as a function of space and time. And that's RESI spectroscopy. Um, but RESI is also great because it can make, make images. Um, and so here is basically an observation. So we have a trace image in the background. 
So this is a, a, a much older instrument than either SDO or SOHO, but it's a 1600 angstrom image. So again, we're seeing these flare ribbons in the photosphere. And then these are basically uh, RESI contours. And uh, so we have thermal contours, 12 to 15 keV, and then we have non-thermal emission at 250 to 500 keV. And if we have this picture of um, basically our, our, our solar flare cartoon, for want of a better word, you can see this, this maps really well onto this sort of emission. So uh, the picture from the hard X-ray point of view and the soft X-ray point of view really does match up with the um, observations. And then finally, we have imaging spectroscopy. So with RESI, what you can do is you can not only get spectra as a function of time, as I said, but also as a function of space. So this is an example where we can get um, basically the electron spectrum, or sorry, we can get the, the photon spectrum and fit it, uh, but as a function of face, space. So here they fit the two foot points, which have uh, quite, uh, quite a similar slope compared to the coronal source, which has a, a much steeper slope. And so this type of uh, imaging spectroscopy, when combined with radio imaging spectroscopy, is really, really powerful to try and diagnose what's happening in the acceleration region and really tie down those uh, acceleration mechanisms uh, in solar flares and especially related to magnetic reconnection. So by studying these, we can really see what magnetic reconnection um, models work. And then unfortunately, RESI is no longer operational. Um, it vastly outlasted its expected lifetime, but uh, it unfortunately is now is dead. However, looking to the future, I can't not mention solar orbiter and sticks. So STIX is a spectrometer telescope imaging x-rays uh, on board solar orbiter. It's what I work on um, as well as Stellar. And so in the future, we can do very, very similar things with STIX. Um, and this is kind of leading into tomorrow as well. So something that is already, this is really recent work from a meeting that we just had last week at the RESI workshop. And this is basically comparing so we've got goes in the top plot. So this is the soft x-rays, this is thermal stuff. We have sticks here. So this is a sticks energy spectrum. Um, so this is non-thermal. We then have a radio spectrum from EOBSA. This is also from a non-thermal population. I and mean, you can see there's a very close relationship between the EOBSA spectrum and the uh, x-ray spectrum. And then this is just a time series showing how there's a really high correlation between um, the x-ray and the radio. And then in the right, I'm just showing that same sort of thing where we've done, uh, basically we fit the observed spectrum in this little range here, and we get out our parameters which describe the electron distribution um, and fit, fit parameters. Yeah, and so that's really all I had to talk about today. Um, I guess I'll, if there's any questions, I'll talk to them or deal with them now. Can I, can I ask a question? Yeah, of course, yeah. Very nice up. presentation, by the way, Shane. Thank you so, so much. Um, just a quick question. Are you aware of any plans for, for synoptic um, hard X-ray imaging uh, observatory in the near future? When you say synoptic, I mean, you, I guess you mean not solar orbiter, because that's obviously kind right. of computer based. Right, 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 right. right. Yeah. Not, not so, yeah. Yeah, there, there, there's the Chinese mission, which I can't remember the name of off the top of my head, that has a hard, hard X-ray imaging detector on board. Um, then there are a number of um, nanosats and um, small missions. A lot of them don't have imaging capability, but they would, uh, I guess, be useful for when STIX was observing and these small satellites were, were observing. Um, and then there's a number of proposals for lower energy and grazing incidents X-ray imagers, which use uh, uh, basically focusing optics instead of the resi slash sticks techniques, which is using modulators and it makes imaging very complicated. Okay, thank you. But when is that uh, Chinese mission due to be launched, do you know? Okay, Laura just put it in the chat, it's A-S-S-O-S. -S. I don't know, it's soon though, like the next I think couple it's, of years. Um, it's 2024, I think is, yeah. is when they're thinking. Um, but I don't think they have a set date, but it's around that time. Yeah. Okay, I hadn't heard about it. And it's a similar mission to its precursors in 
X-ray imaging spectroscopy? Um, yeah, it, yeah, it's kind of more like Yoko. Okay. Like Yoko, like a modern version of, of Yoko. Um, so yeah, it's kind of it's not resi, so it's not a spinning thing. It's a fixed collimators. Um, so yeah, more, more like Yoko. Any more questions from students? No. I just, when you showed that current sheet, Shane, um, that really famous event from yeah. 2017, I mean, that's bigger than the actual current sheet, yeah? How, like, what's yeah. the size of the current sheet versus the thing we see, which is the emission around it? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, obviously, the, the thing we see is much, much bigger than the current sheet. The current sheet was, would not be resolved in any EUV images. I mean, I think, I think we're talking about, what, tens to hundreds of kilometers for a current sheet across, maybe? Whereas, you know, th those pixels are, are many hundreds of kilometers across um, at the best. So, yeah, we really don't resolve the current sheet itself at all. But the idea is that um, the, that emission that we see in that fine structure is from the current sheet, but it's, it's not resolved completely at all. Okay. Yeah, I guess people go mad when you call it a current sheet. It really should be <laughs> yeah. a plasma sheet, right? <laughs> it's this hot plasma, yeah. Um, it looks like what you might expect a current sheet to look like, but yeah, it's, it's definitely not definitive. Do you, do you ever see uh, tearing mode instabilities? There's just too small. Yeah, I don't think, but there is there is those those studies where they've looked at like downward flowing motions along the current sheet or just at the bottom of these structures, which I mean, I guess could be related. But yeah, I don't think you could directly image the actual. Um, yeah, I, I guess your tearing mode, um, you know, the blobs along your you know, it must be of of the order of the length scale of the current sheet. So they're they're tiny. So I don't yeah. think there's ever been anything that's shown. The only thing is in temporal data from my, from from some of the from cluster, I think it is, you know, as they fly through it, they they can actually measure the electric field um, and they can see the length scale of the blobs as it passes by the spacecraft. And that gives them sorry, they see a time scale and they convert that into a length scale so they can fly through it in the Earth's magnetosphere. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't there that thing that like drifting pulsations could be a signature of, of these things? Um, I was just about to say uh, radio is probably the only domain where people attribute something in the data to the tearing mode instability. Well, maybe in x-rays as well, when it's something pulsates like that. Um, they always say it must be from some sort of tearing mode. But yeah, I know they've definitely looked at like the variation of the reconnection rate in terms of magnetic islands and what that would mean for the size of the islands that you'd have to have mm. but again it's that's based on times rather than you know actually spatially resolving them sure. yeah i mean in uh, in radio we have um i think hold so it this uh image of a type 4 radio burst uh, with low far um, that really looks to mimic a sort of a current sheet uh, scenario where you have on top of the loop this elongated um, source. And you can see in the dynamic spectra that there are many fine features with some periodicity. So maybe, I don't know, own or... What, 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 what event was that, Pietro? <clears throat> um, let me think. I think it's in 2014. Um, um, we're, we're preparing just uh, some images uh, with, uh, with one of the students, but I showed you oh, some time ago the video, the movie. Yeah. Um, I'll share again, maybe, but okay. it could be a further investigation there. It's, it's a very nice event, and uh, especially adding the information on the polarization. Um, that's uh, for sure something that the radio can help there. Okay, and these were observed in LOFAR, yeah? Yeah, yeah, we have the okay. imaging, uh, so unfortunately like the... only on the um, HBA, but um, but the, that part of the type four is 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 well imaged, and and it, and it really looks like um, uh, we see the CME, and then you see where the CME is anchored, the sort of uh, 
you, you see the foot points and, yeah. and, and of top of the loop, this type four radio burst, it's a moving type four radio burst that moves as, you know, probably the, 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 the wall magnetic structure is expanding, including the, the, the current sheet where the reconnection supposedly happened. So yeah, yeah it's, it's quite interesting. Maybe uh, we'll talk uh, again for, for in two weeks, we're having a workshop, uh, of course, in Astron. And there we're starting to work on specific events. And that's why actually this came, comes perfectly because we start asking questions, what, <laughs> what can be done? And, um, and this event is something that we really need to continue to, to, to check. Uh, okay, so, so it's, it's not yet published. Um, we are. We have submitted the first part where we are just using uh, Stokes I mm. for the imaging. Okay. Um, but and the student is now really doesn't want to continue anymore. It's really a lot of work. So he said, "Okay, let's just publish this." Um, and so there is a lot of work that that is um, left to, to to be done on that. So anyway, maybe over we chat and and you can uh, have a look. Uh, sure. Yeah. Looking forward to it. Okay, I guess, is there, well, we're a, a good yeah. few minutes past now. What do you think, Shano? Um, should yeah, we should probably for lunch? break for lunch, get everyone, get some food. Uh, well, our lunch, uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, these are two hours ahead of us. <laughs> afternoon snack, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, your guys' afternoon snack, our lunch. Um, yeah, so what time do we reconvene at? Um, Half one Irish time, so in 40 minutes. Yeah. Three fifty minutes. Okay. Okay. Um, great. I'll actually stop the recording now and then see you in 50 minutes. Yeah. All right. See you soon. Right. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys.